Good morning. When I was 48 years old, I learned to see in a whole new way. And in fact, in a way that most doctors and scientists said I could not possibly learn. You see, all my life, my eyes were misaligned, which meant that each eye saw a different region of space and as a result brought into my brain a very confusing picture. I had double vision. So when I was about three or four months old, like any baby of that age, I started to use my hand and reach out for things. But how could I grab that tempting toy hanging from my crib rail if I saw two of it, if I didn't know where it was actually located in space? I had to adapt, and my brain found a way to adapt. What it did is it looked through one eye, and it turned in or crossed the other. And then I could ignore or suppress the input coming from the crossed eye. Now I had a single view of the world. I could reach for those tempting toys on my crib. But this adaptation came with a serious cost. I did not have 3D vision. Because to see in 3D, you have to use your two eyes together. You have to combine the input from the two eyes. And my brain did not do that. Instead, it looked through one eye and turned in across the other. And I had a habit of looking through one eye with one glance and then switching over and looking through the other eye with the next glance. Oh, I had three surgeries as a child, three eye surgeries that made my eyes look straighter. But the surgeries didn't change the way I used my eyes. I still looked through one eye and turned in the other. But now the eye turn was more subtle, so most people didn't notice. I was still stereo blind. I still could not see in 3D. And in fact, almost all physicians and scientists said, you can't see in 3D now, and you'll never be able to see in 3D. Because there was a belief that the ability to see in 3D, to combine the input from the two eyes, the circuitry in the brain necessary to do that had to develop during a window of time in early childhood, a window of time called the critical period. And I was cross-eyed during the critical period. I lost out. There was no way as an older person that I could develop this skill because the adult brain just isn't that flexible. And in fact, as a neuroscientist, I lectured in class each year on critical periods in visual development. And I used my own story as an example to show how well the, the theory of critical periods fit reality. There were limits, I told my students, to how much an adult brain can change. Well, my thinking began to change in November of 2001 when I first consulted a developmental optometrist named Teresa Ruggiero, Dr. Ruggiero in Northampton. I went to see her not to gain 3D vision. That wasn't even on my radar. But my visual problems continued to worsen as I got older. And so when I looked in the distance, everything seemed to jitter. And this made driving difficult and frightening. So I went to see Dr. Ruggiero because I wanted to gain more confidence and competence for simply chauffeuring my children around town. Now, Dr. Ruggiero was, of course, aware of the whole concept of the critical period and the effects of crossed eyes on 3D vision. But she was also aware of much more recent studies, studies done in this century, that indicate that our own actions influence the circuitry in our brain. All my life, I had not used my eyes the way most people do. I didn't know how to aim the two eyes at the same place in space at the same time. If I could learn this, 
Could I actually change the circuitry in my brain? Could I develop the ability to see in 3D? Well, a normal viewer, if they were looking at an object close to them, would aim both eyes at that object by turning both eyes in together to aim it at that close object, an action called convergence. Then, if they wanted to look at something further away, they would turn both eyes out to aim both eyes at that more distant object, an action called divergence. At what age do you learn these virgence movements? For a person with normal vision, you develop these virgence movements at around two to four months of age. But I had never developed them. I was now going to learn through optometric vision therapy how to make virgence movements at the age of 48. So how was I going to do this? I didn't really know how I moved my eyes. I wasn't conscious of which eye I was looking through at any one time and which eye I was turning in. I needed some way to get feedback as to how I used my two eyes. And along the way, I learned a number of vision therapy techniques. But the one that was my absolute favorite, and the one you all can experience today when you whip out your strings, <laughs> is the Brock string. So the Brock string is a device as elegant as it is simple. It is simply a bead on a string. And it was developed by an optometrist named Frederick Brock. What I want you to do is take the bead and put it at the far end of the string. Then take the close end of the string and hold it up to your nose, the bridge of your nose. Put the string straight in front of you at arm's length and look at the bead. Hopefully you all see one bead. Do any of you see two strings? Do you see two string images? As if, in, as like an inverted bead, V, with the two strings converging on the bead? Do you know what you're seeing? Those two string images are giving you the line of sight of your two eyes. And your two eyes then are aimed at that bead at the end of the string. So now, go ahead and put the bead somewhere toward the middle of the string. For some of you, this next exercise will be easier if the bead's a little away from the middle, further from you than the middle, for some maybe closer. But take the bead and put it in about the middle of the string and look at it again. And this time, do you see two string images converging on the bead and then two string images yep. diverging away in a configuration that looks something like this? that X configuration. Okay, when I first started to do this exercise, I was amazed. I now had a feedback to know where my two eyes were pointing. If I saw one bead, but also just one string, then I knew I was only using one eye and suppressing the other. If I saw the double string image, but it wasn't converging on the bead, then I knew my two eyes were not aimed at the same place in space at the same time. Now, I started, I could at first only do this exercise, and this is very common for people who have been cross-eyed since infancy, when the bead was about one inch from my nose. But over time, I could gradually move the bead further and further away and get that X configuration and you know what? I didn't stop with a mini Brock string like you have there. <laughs> I ended up using an 11 foot string. And I still do these exercises each day. And in the morning, I jump on a mini trampoline and I look at one bead and I get that X configuration. And then I look at the further bead and so on and so forth. But I want to tell you about the time when I first moved from looking at just one bead to looking at two beads on the string. I was in Dr. Ruggiero's office working with a vision therapist and she said, okay, look at the closer bead. I said, yep, got the X. Now look at the further bead. Got it. Okay, look at the close bead again. 
Got it. Now the further read. Now the close read. And I said to her, and I remember this moment as if it were just yesterday. I said to her, I can feel my eyes moving. I can feel them turning in to see the close bead. I can feel them turning out to see the further bead. And she said, that's great. We'll do a little bit more practice. Then we'll move on to another therapy exercise. And I said, no, I just want to keep doing this. It felt so good. And I wanted to remember what it felt like so that I could drop the rock string and go out into the world and see in this way. Well, that day, when that vision therapy session ended, I went back to my car and I sat down in the driver's seat and I looked at the steering wheel and it was floating in front of the dashboard with a palpable pocket of space between the steer steering wheel and the dashboard. And I had never seen anything like that before. And I thought, is this 3D vision? <laughs> and then I thought, Impossible! I'm a neuroscientist! I know better! The day happened to be the day after my 48th birthday. I was more than 40 years past the critical period for the development of 3D vision. So I told myself that the sun, which was setting, was casting an odd light into the car, and that explained the strange illusion. But the next day, I got up, I did my vision therapy procedures, including the Brock string, and then I got in my car to go to work, and I went to adjust the rear view mirror, and it was floating in front of the windshield. And all that day, and over the next number of months, my vision transformed in the most remarkable way. Sink thoughts has stuck out at me. <laughs> And I thought to myself, I've never seen something so beautiful. I went into the restroom at Mount Holyoke where I teach, and there was another student, th uh, there was a student there, I'm a professor there, and I said to her, look at that sink faucet. I said, I've never seen an arc as beautiful as the arc of that sink faucet. And the student kind of left. That was 10 years ago. I, she graduated. I hope she's far away. <laughs> Trees. Trees took on the most spectacular view. Sure, I knew the canopy of trees was round, but I had never seen it that way before. Now I could see that the outer branches of a tree enclose and capture volumes of space through which the inner branches penetrate. Snow falls. My first 3D snowfall was a remarkable experience because I could see how each flake occupied its own space and the pockets of space between the different snowflakes and how they all produced a beautiful three-dimensional dance. And when I looked in a mirror, this isn't me, but... <laughs> But she's really pretty. <laughs> when I looked in the mirror, I could see that my reflection was not on the pane of the mirror, but was actually behind it in some sort of reflected space. And I finally understood what Lewis Carroll meant when he wrote for the title of his book, Through the Looking Glass. But how could I make this happen? How is it that I gained 3D vision when other people hadn't been able to do this. I think a lot of it has to do with this fact. Older techniques used to try to teach a cross-eyed person to three, see in 3D was to project the same image into the two eyes using equipment like stereoscopes. And so the idea was we'll give the same image to the two eyes and then the person will fuse those two images because they don't normally see uh, the same image coming into the two eyes because the eyes are crossed. But it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because the person's eyes are still crossed. They're still not looking at the same place in space at the same time. The only reason to get a person like me with crossed eyes to see in 3D 
is that that person has to do the moving of their eyes to direct them to the same place in space at the same time. Our actions and our perception are intimately linked in a constant, continuous dialogue. So I learned that the adult brain is actually a lot more plastic than I ever thought it was. But our brains, my brain, your brain, an adult brain, it doesn't learn exactly like an infant's brain. It doesn't respond and change with every stimulus or every strong stimulus. Instead, an adult brain changes as a result of active learning. You have to become very self-aware. You have to learn how to change old, maybe very entrenched habits into new ones. And these experiences have to be accompanied by a sense of novelty and a sense of accomplishment in order for you to continue with all the hard work and practice that it's going to take. So if you read in a textbook that something is not possible, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> With a great deal of self-awareness, a lot of hard work, and the right training, many of you may be able to accomplish what was once thought to be impossible. Thank you.